inserts. And we're going to take a, a few minutes to talk about the SQL statement that does inserts, and then we'll see how it integrates into an ASP.NET page. Um, this is sort of the, you know, I, I think every teacher has like the stuff that they feel that they absolutely have to cover. Then they have the stuff that like, well, if we have a little bit of extra time, we'll do it. This is sort of the end of like the absolute minimum that I would want to cover. So it's good news that we're getting that in. Um, I do like to have a little bit more time to cover some of the other stuff. Um, We'll see how that goes next week. If I can at least get through the insert today, we'll be in good shape. And then we can talk about next week, um, um, so, so like what the next thing would be. Like if there's another two weeks in class, what would happen after everyone ran out of the room screaming because there's two more weeks of class. But um, we can talk about that and uh, go from there. Uh, and keep in mind that the project is, is, is a place for you to explore some things that you might want to do, but don't necessarily know how to do. In other words, you, should, you shouldn't necessarily shoehorn your project into what you know, if that makes any sense. So if there's something that you want to do that we haven't covered, bring that to my attention, and we can talk about it either collectively or individually. You know, um, it's almost like, um, you know, it, it's funny, like in math class, it's like, you, you know, you have problems on a math uh, homework assignment. You know that whatever was on the page before is what you're going to use to solve the problem, right? So, it, like when you're in third grade, if they were talking about adding, it's like, hmm, these problems deal with adding, so I'm going to use adding no matter what, you know? So I, I'm convinced that a teacher could throw off the entire class if they like slipped in a subtraction problem or something in there because everyone would see that and say, well, I'm supposed to use adding to solve this, so I will. Uh, I don't know what I'm getting at with this. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is that um, think in terms of, you know, think in terms of creating something that would be usable. If you were someone that was using this site, how would you want it to act? And if the standard ways of doing things that we've talked about in class works for that situation, great. If the standard ways doesn't work for that situation, then consider other possibilities. And if you're a little stuck on that, um, uh, let me know. And I'll give you a very quick for instance. And this might be something that we'll talk about next week. We'll, we'll see depending on the time. Let's say I was writing a like a, uh, uh, an online uh, forum or discussion or something like that where people could post comments on something. So you could, you could put a picture up um, on, on uh, your website and people could post comments to it, kind of like an Instagram or something like that. All right? If you think about it, um, a comment, what, what's a comment table going to look like in the database? Well, it's going to have probably the primary key of the picture that you're commenting on, right, so that you can associate the comments with that picture. Um, it will probably have the primary key of the user that is making the comment, all right? Um, so in other words, the person would have to log on because God knows you probably don't want to have anonymous comments anywhere on the Internet. All right? It's bad enough when you have comments with names associated with them, but let alone anonymous. Um, you would want the date and time that the comment was made so that you could sort things so it made sense, right? You know, so, you know, if you, could, you could display the comments in a, in a linear way so it would make sense. And then finally, you'd want the comment itself. Well, if we think about that scenario, only one of those pieces is going to be entered by the user, right? The user isn't going to enter their user ID. The user is not going to enter the primary key of the, of the photo. The user is not going to enter the date time stamp. All right? <clears throat> That's all coming from somewhere else. The user ID is going to come from probably a session variable. The photo that you're commenting probably is going to be on the query string. The um, system date and time, you can ask the server for the system date and time. All right? The only thing that the user is going to be keying in is going to be the comment itself. All right? So the kind of way that we've been doing
doing inserts, updates, and deletes, well, we will be doing inserts, but we've done updates, is that you have a form where the user enters everything except maybe the primary key, and then you hit submit, all right? That kind of strategy wouldn't work here because we wouldn't want it to do that. You'd really just want a big text box, and then you could write the code to actually create the insert statement. So that's what I mean about don't sort of shoehorn the functionality. Do what makes sense for your application, and if it's something we haven't covered, then do some investigation or we can talk about it individually. All right. Um, Let's look at doing an insert with the tables that we were working on last time. Now it's important to know uh, a couple things about this. First of all, um, we, we need to know what an insert statement looks like. We need to know what is going to make an insert statement fail, all right, because we want to be able to handle that. Um, and we need to know that in general terms, the stuff that you have available for inserts is very similar to what you had for updates and deletes. That is, there's an inserting and an inserted method that you can call before and after the insert occurs. Um, there is um, a SQL statement associated with the data source um, and, and so on. So let's look at an insert first of all. And we're going to start off with, let's say we had a um, person table that we were going to enter into. And let's say the person table contained sort of the standard things that we'd have in a person table. The first name, the last name, the address, city, state, zip, email, phone number, and so on. What is the statement that does inserts to the database? What is the name of the statement? Insert, insert exactly. There you go. Otherwise, I'd be talking about the add statement or the new or something like that. So the insert, the insert statement is like the update and delete in that it only works on one table at a time. So if you are inserting into several tables, you need several inserts. Now, the one thing that we do not cover in this class, but it's worth mentioning, is the notion of a database transaction. All right? When we talk about a database transaction, we're talking about a series of SQL statements that are executed. All right? And these are said to be atomic. All right? Ooh, that sounds scary. All right? What do I mean by atomic? It means that they can't be split up. They have to happen all together or either they all succeed or they all fail. So a classic case of a, a, of a transaction that's atomic would be if I transferred money to my checking account, uh, to my from my checking account to my savings account, right? If you think about that, that's really two transactions, all right? That is me taking money out of my checking account, that's transaction one, so there's a withdrawal from my checking account, and then there's a deposit into my savings account. Well, those are two separate inserts. Those are two separate transactions. And if you think about it, either both of them better succeed or both of them better fail, right? If one of them succeeds and one of them fails, someone's got a problem, right? So if the withdrawal from my checking account succeeded, so I would, I'm transferring $100 from my checking to savings account. If the $100 withdrawal succeeded and the $100 deposit failed, then I'm out $100, bucks, right? And I'm going to be mad. If the other way around worked, if the deposit to my sa uh, savings <coughs> account worked, but the withdrawal from the checking account worked, uh, did not work, it failed, then 
I just gained $100 and the bank's out $100. So either way, someone's going to be mad if that succeeds or, or fails partially. So what you do with the transaction is you start a transaction, you execute it. If everything went okay, then you commit it. And committing is finalizing a transaction and saying that, yes, <coughs> this succeeded and we're all done. All right, and therefore you can you can finalize it. The opposite of committing is rolling back. So if I executed a couple of transactions and one of them failed, I would want to roll back the whole transaction. All right, because hey, I might be annoyed that I can't transfer a hundred from my checking to savings. All right, that might annoy me, but it isn't going to annoy me as much as if I'm out a hundred bucks. All right, so therefore. All succeeds or all fails. We're not going to do those kinds of transactions. All right, we're going to do simple single inserts. But I did want to draw your attention to that because that's also something that exists in the database realm. Another example to that would be if you're writing an order to a database. All right, if I'm placing an order, you know. I, I'm ordering and I want shipped to my home and you know and I'm using this credit card number for it and I've ordered three items. It kind of it kind of should all succeed or all fail. Because it would be weird if I like just got like two of the items. It would be like, well what happened to the third item, you know? Or if the item updates worked but the header information didn't work then their system would have that they're shipping out some items, but there wouldn't be a customer associated with it, so you wouldn't know who to ship it out to. So if you think about it, if you go to place an order, if there's a problem with the database, it should tell you, hey, I can't process this order. Not like, hey, um, we can kind of process this order and you'll get some of your items. All right, That wouldn't be uh, an operable situation. All right, insert statement though itself, a single insert statement, works on one table. So it starts out with into, uh, insert, into, and then the name of the table, then a list of columns, Then a list of values, all right, like this. And then you're done. Now, a couple observations. First of all, there needs to be a one-to-one -one relationship between the columns and the values, all right? So if you have three columns that you're inserting into a table, then you need three values, and it just matches up first column with first value, first or second column with second value, and so on down the line. Which, you know, makes sense. Now, again, why they didn't do this the same way they did an update statement, I have no idea. All right, it's beyond me. There's probably a very good reason, but I can't think of it right now. You know, the update statement, remember, we have expressions. Set column one equal to value one. Set column two equal to value two. So not only do the column names need to be valid and the values match up with the column names, but they have to be of the same type. So if I'm inserting into a numeric field, I have to give a number. I can't give a string or something like that. All right. If I am inserting into a table that has a auto number key, a generated key, then I do not need to include the, the key in the insert statement. The database automatically generates it for you. All right. Now, what would make an insert statement fail? Well, syntax errors would make it fail, but that doesn't count. All right. Um, yeah, if you got the table name wrong or you got the column name wrong, it's going to fail. All right? But that's not what we mean. What would make an insert statement fail other than a syntax error? Yes? If you try to enter like a duplicate index? Right. Number one is if you try to 
If you tried to, to, to um, insert into a table and with a, with a duplicate primary key or a duplicate index if the index was set to um, be um, unique. All right. Now, the primary key isn't a concern if we use auto numbers, right? So if we use auto numbers, then that's taken care of for us. So we don't really have to worry about that. But we would have a case of uh, a possibility if we have a unique index that, that would be taken care of for us. And if we try to do an insert, it could fail if it got a duplicate. In short, any database constraint that is in the database, if that's not met, <clears throat> if those conditions aren't met by the insert statement, it's going to fail. So what are some examples of constraints? The wrong data type. I try to put a string in a numeric field. That's going to fail. Missing a field that is required, that is going to <clears throat> fail. So the first name is required, and my insert statement doesn't contain a first name. All right. Then it's going to fail. All right. Lastly, um, well, the duplicate keys or duplicate uh, indexes would be another example. And finally, um, if I violated the referential integrity. So, for example, if I had a faculty member and a department, if I put in an invalid department ID, all right, if I set up a foreign key between department and faculty and I uh, supplied an invalid department ID, um, then, you know, I'd be sunk. Now, sort of the same thing applies for the inserts as did with the updates. How do we keep these errors from happening or at least deal with these errors? Well, we can deal with them a few different ways. Number one, by using auto number keys, we don't ever have to worry about writing an, a duplicate key. All right? By correctly constructing our form, we can take care of some issues. So, for example, if I put validation on a, on a required field, making sure that it's required, that'll prevent me getting that kind of error. All right? If I put validation for the data type, that can prevent the other kind of error. So, for example, if I have a field that has to be a number, I put a validation control saying, this has to be a number, all right? And that will prevent those sorts of errors from occurring. If there is a case of referential integrity, whereas I am having a foreign key, then I would uh, put it such that um, you could only select a valid um, item from the other table. So I would use, for example, a drop down or radio buttons or something like that. All right. So by my form design, I can prevent a lot of possible errors from occurring. All right. But there's a couple of catches there. All right. One of the catches is that um, JavaScript might not be enabled, so my validation might not work. So that's a potential catch. Uh, a second potential issue could be that some of the errors, like duplicate user ID, I can't really do anything in the form to prevent that. All right? If I'm entering a new person into my table and they try to put in MLZ as their user ID, well, I can't really design the form to prevent that, at least not easily. So we're going to adopt the strategy that we did with updates. Okay? We're not even going to bother checking for that, but we are going to scrutinize and see if the insert worked, and if it did not work, display some sort of uh, user-friendly message that will help the, the, the user debug what went wrong. All right? So remember, we can prevent errors by our form design, we can prevent errors by our, by our validation, but we're always going to have that like last fail-safe in case, for example, JavaScript is not enabled, or there's some kind of error that we did not anticipate, or there's some kind of error that is impractical or, or difficult to um, catch otherwise. We'll let it fail, and we'll just be there with our brooms to, to clean up the mess after the insert doesn't work. All right, so let's look at the table we had last time.
time, or one of the tables we had last time, and let's do an insert on it. Let's go into the database. Year to date, 
purchases, if they place a new order, I'd have to increment that. If they change the new order, I'd ha or if they change an order, I'd have to go and change that. Finally, if they deleted an order, I'd have to go and recalculate that. So one change, one event would require me to do things in two different places. So that's not good. There is a very, very, very rare instance where you would do something like that. And in database, this is the D word. All right? We don't even like to say it, people that teach databases. But I guess, you know, we're all adults here. I can, I can use this term. And the term, of course, is denormalization. All right? Denormalization is where you have a database that for certain very special reasons you decide that you have to break some of the rules of good database design. Now that should not be your default case, right? This is an exception. You know, think of it like this, you know. Let's say um, your friend is injured and, and you um, drive faster than the speed limit to get him to the hospital, all right? You've broken a rule, right? But you have a good reason to do that. And I think most people would say, yeah, you're justified, right? Um, on the other hand, if you, uh, you know, if Game of Thrones is coming on and you're still driving home and you're going to running a little bit late to speed for that reason, probably isn't a good reason, um, especially with DVRs and on demand and all that, all right? So the point is, with denormalization, is it's the same thing. Under certain rare instances, it may be okay to break some of the rules of database design. Now, typically those things come into doing something like keeping track of totals. All right? So we would, um, you know, maybe keep track of, the, the, the amount that a customer has purchased year to date, all right? And typically, you only do this when you've tried to do it the proper way and the performance is so bad that you have to do something, all right? Remember, if, you know, <clears throat> you design a well-designed, beautifully normalized, you have the ERD on your refrigerator because it looks so beautiful, sort of database and it takes five hours to get a report that the CEO of your company needs, CEO isn't gonna, gonna, gonna worry about the fact that, well, Zeller's told you that, that you don't denormalize. You know, they're gonna say, gee, I need this in a minute, right? So therefore you take steps and you could denormalize it. But again, it's a last resort, not a first resort, all right? Just because there's some situations where speeding might be okay, that doesn't mean that that should be your default policy to drive as fast as you want to. All right? Um, so there are cases when you denormalize and put computed columns in. But you, don't, you, you do that from a position of having studied the situation and finding out um, that it doesn't work or it isn't practical or something along, that, along those lines. Now, not in Access, but in other databases, there are things called triggers and stored procedures that sort of mitigate the damage. A trigger or stored procedure is a set of instructions that you can trigger to have occur when something happens. So, for example, I go and add a new order for a customer. I could write an insert trigger to take the order amount and add it to the customer's total year-to-date purchases. That sort of takes, you know, gets rid of the sting of the redundancy of having the data in two places because the updating of one of those places happens automatically. All right? Now that makes things more complicated to set up and so on, but if you need to do it, you need to do it. Anyhow, this is a table that we're going to go and we're going to write an insert statement to. All right? Notice a couple things about this. These are all text fields. This is a foreign key to skill level table. This has to be a date time. This is a unique index. And this is an auto number field. So let's write the insert statement for this.
insert into player. And if we want to, we can write it however makes sense for us. As far as capitalizing it or having everything on the same line or what. Then, we have the values. Now, in the case of an actual insert, we need actual values. So we might do something like this. First name equals Mike. Last name equals Zellers. I cannot type to save my life today. Think exactly how you delineate a date or how you indicate that the date varies between databases. I think you use a pound sign in access. All right. Now notice how the stuff matches up. In other words, the first element here is first name. The first value is F name, uh, is the value of F name. L name, L name, email, email, and so on. Now we can probably, remember the nice thing about SQL is that we can stretch this out on multiple lines if we want, if we think it makes it more understandable. should, when the day is done, if we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns, we should have seven values. Notice I do not need to put the player ID in there because that's an auto number field. All right. Questions about this so far? Now, a couple observations. Obviously, we don't want to insert the same person over and over and over again. All right. So therefore, what are you going to see in, uh, do you suppose, when we get to ASP.NET for this? Question We're going to see question marks, right? It's always the right answer. Always the right answer. Seven question marks. Seven question marks. Hey, I'm not making this up. No, you, 
You don't include the auto number because that's generated. Now, notice when I put the question marks there, I don't do anything like with the formatting. All right? Like, if you noticed what I had up a minute ago, um, the strings were in quotes, the numbers were not in quotes, the dates were in uh, pound signs. You don't need to do that with this. All right? And that's actually good news because... Um, they sometimes call this sanitizing your inputs or, or scrubbing your inputs or cleaning your inputs. Um, that is formatting them to be in a SQL expression. Um, why is that? Well, because if you don't, you can run into some problems. Now, fortunately for us, the way ASP.NET handles it, it handles this for us. But you should be aware of this because it can cause some headaches if you write database applications in other platforms. Um, both in terms of um, getting actual errors and uh, uh, being vulnerable to certain kinds of security attacks, namely what are called SQL injection attacks. All right. Actually, I think I did that wrong when I put the double quotes. I should have put single quotes uh, up in there. But... I didn't. That's okay. All right. Let's say we have a name like O'Donnell. <coughs> All right. So last name equals O'Donnell. And again, remember that should be single quotes. O'Donnell. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. It's going to see that O, all right, and the quote after it, and think that's the end of the string. That being the case, what is Donald, then? It's an error, is what it is, all right? Now, fortunately for us, the SQL parameters handle that for us. So when this is part of an ASP.NET application, we don't really have to do anything on our own. It, it, it handles it for us. Now, how is this used as part of a SQL injection attack? Well, let's look. Let's Google SQL injection attack. anyone can edit it, it's going to have the best possible information. It's like, it's like Reddit. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's Bahamas. <laughs> Why, is that a Huffman thing? Yeah. Okay. And like, you know, I've always picked it up and how like, inaccurate it is. this in as the name. Alright? Kind of a funny name, right? So my last name is A quotation mark semicolon drop table users which deletes the entire table. Select star from user info where T equal. Okay, that's that. Uh, we're just going to look at this part because this part's enough to show the damage. So, if this were popped into our insert or injected into our insert statement, it would look like this. Actually, probably the better thing would be to put like that. 
And what would happen? Well, it would try to do this insert, thinking that that's the end of the statement, and fail, and then go and try to execute this, which would cause the table to be dropped, all right, which is probably not a good thing. All right? So by manipulating the inputs and manipulating those special characters in the inputs, people can attack the database. Now, what's the answer to this? What if you have a name like O'Donnell? Well, if you have a name like O'Donnell, you actually escape the character. Now, what does escape mean? Well, it's different depending on the context, but in the case of databases, you would do this. You would substitute two single quotes for one single quote, and that would be escaping that character. So, what does that tell the database? That tells the database, hey, the quote after this quote isn't really an end quote, it's a character that's part of this string. So it would handle it correctly. Now, the good news is, is if your mind drifted off and you started to think about Thanksgiving while I was going into this explanation, it doesn't matter because the SQL, the ASP.NET parameters handle this for you. It would do the conversion for you to convert this into a safe format by putting in the extra single quote. All right? So, that's sort of the good news. What is that tech cartoon? XC? Does anyone know? Oh, XCD. Yeah. There's another letter in there, though. I'm pretty sure. Oh. Yeah, it's like four letters. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Because they, they actually have a pretty good might be Y in there. I don't know. It's like X, Y, C, D. Let's try that. I'm hesitant to Google anything that has an X in it. <laughs> but I do know the first letter is X, K, C, D. X, K, C, D. Hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh dear, did he break something? In a way, did you really name your son Robert, single quote, parenthesis, semicolon, drop table students, semicolon? Oh yes, little Bobby tables we call them. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. So, I thought that was, that was a pretty good one. Now, the good news in all this is, <laughs> again, if you drifted off somewhere like 15 minutes ago, SQL handles this for you. But I do think it's important to mention, because not everything, or I'm sorry, not SQL, ASP.NET handles this for you. So I think it's important, important mentioning, because if you were doing something like this in PHP or other programming languages, um, or if you were writing your own SQL statements that did not use the parameters, all right, uh, the parameter <coughs> object within ASP.NET, you need to know and take account of this, all right? When I was developing an old school ASP, before it was ASP.NET, when it was just plain old ASP, all right, there was no built-in capability of this, so I wrote my own function to go in and scan a thing and look for offensive characters and, and substitute uh, escape them so that they wouldn't cause any problems. All right. So very, very, very long introduction. But let's go in and let's go
go in and add the ability to insert into a player table. So let's go and open Visual Studio, which I already have done. Open my website. So I'm going to create a register page where I can enter in a brand new person. So type new, file, web form, and I'll make that register. One thing about inserting is we, excuse me, we cannot insert on a grid view. We can only insert on a details view. I don't know why that is, but it is. So my insert here is going to take place on a details view. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a details view. And I'm going to create a SQL data source. Then I'm going to go and connect them together. So configure data source. What database does it come from? That one. I'm going to go lazy here and select everything from this except I'm going to close this because it didn't have my birth date field. There you go. So now I'm going to go in configure data source connection string. All right. Now I'm going to pick all these fields. I'm going to click advanced and generate the insert, update, and delete statements. Next, you can test the query. Now here's the interesting thing, even though I'm not going to be using this for queries, um, it, it is required to have a query. Now, since I'm using this to do updates to the database, again, it's better to work with single tables. Well, you might say, well, doesn't the skill table get involved? It will, but it will get involved when we make a drop-down for it. It isn't involved in the initial insert or the select or anything like that. All right. So I click finish here. So am I, you know. We have a three-day week, though, this week, so I hope you have a good and restful Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, I'm old as dirt, so I'm sorry, too. All right. I'll go and check the SQL data source. And we got this. Now, remember that we've set up our SQL data source to handle inserts, but we haven't set up, set up our details view to do that. All right. Now, this page, being that it is a register page, all right, is going to... Um, is going to automatically go in into, into insert mode. All right. So what I have to do is I have to go in here and say under properties that inserting is enabled. And what's more, I want to go directly into not read only mode, but I want to go directly into insert mode. So I'll get a blank screen with the defaults, which are text boxes. All right. Now, again, there's certain things that 
the defaults wouldn't be good for, right? For example, first name's a required field, so I would need to put a validator on it. Um, user password, I want to be a password control, not a text box. So I would have to go in and change that. Skill level would make more sense as a drop down instead of a text box, so I have to change that. Birth date, I would want to validate to make sure that it was a valid date. So I'd have to go and change that. I may even want to validate that the birth date is, depending on what this was registering for, um, earlier than a certain date and time, like maybe earlier than, you know, you, you know, because you don't want infants registering for your site, all right? Yes? Is most of this done through that template? Yeah, exactly. All that stuff would be handled via a template column, all right? So remember, anytime you deviate from the norm, you deviate from the from the basic default of just having text boxes that um, you, you do that with a template column. Now, the nice thing is, though, is we can still test this here as long as we make sure that we follow all the rules and, and, and uh, enter in the right data and everything should work. All right, so I'm going to go and test this. Set this as a start page. Run it. But before I do that, I want to look at the SQL statement because I don't think we looked at the SQL statement that it generated. And sure enough, you're going to see kind of what we had there. Insert in the player, player ID. Ooh, that's not good. All right. This is why it's always good to know how to look at the code as well as just doing this. So, ooh, I don't like that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cancel out of here, cancel debugging, and I'm gonna deal with that because this is gonna cause me a problem. All right, let's see what kind of problem it's gonna give me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, at least it matched up the right number of things, but that's still not good. So let's go and look at our source. Now, here again, this is where, you know, the right tool for the right job. You know, be able to deal with some things through the GUI, deal with some things via the code view. This is a classic case of something like, well, I would not want to wrestle with the GUI for too long on this, right? Because that would drive me crazy. The whole idea of GUIs is to limit what you can do, right? To make your life easier, all right? Now, in limiting what you can do, if it works for you, that's great. It's made your life easier. If it doesn't work for you, that's bad because you're going to have to go and change it and the GUI deliberately makes those kinds of things hard to do by shielding you from some of the functionality. So let's go and look at the source of this. And if you notice, I should be able to take care of this by, if I look at my insert statement, There's my insert statement, insert in a player, player ID, blah, 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 eight question marks. So if I get rid of this, boom, shoot. Get rid of one of the question marks. Have to 
to be the first one. That was a joke. It really doesn't have to be. You just have to make sure it's the right number of them. And then finally, I have to go in and delete this from the insert parameters. I would characterize this as a bug in ASP.NET. It ought to be smart enough to know that this is an auto number key and therefore don't include it in the insert. But, you know, deal with it. You know, it, <laughs> you know when something does uh, a good amount of your work, you know, that's the risk that you run. It is not going to do it in the way that you need it to be done. So that's why it's good and that's why it's important to know and be able to look at the code um, and, and change that. Because I don't know how you'd make that work via the GUI. You'd probably be able to, but I don't know. All right, so now we should be ready to run this guy. So I go and run this. So I'll put in something. I'm going to add one that, that should work. All right. by the way, when I put my birth year as like 1989 a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, so let's click insert. Well, yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that's a good point. This could be a coach, though, right? The changes in the request are not successful because they create duplicate values. Do I must already have dug? Do I already have dug in here? is foiled again. Doug. All right. And it did it, right? How do I know it did it? Well, it didn't tell me it didn't, <laughs> which probably isn't a good, uh, a good reasoning. But if we go and look in this table, we will see that they are in there. Nice. All right. Now, we've already seen what I was going to show you next, the fact that there was an error. All right. And again, how do we handle that error? The same thing applies that we did before. Um, we um, we um, are going to want to put in um, code in the item inserted event. All right, so after the insert has occurred, we want to do something. We want to check to see if there's an exception, and if there's an exception, display uh, a, a user-friendly error message. Now, when they're done registering, is there a good chance that they're going to want to register a second identity? <laughs> Probably not, you know, unless they're Batman and, I would say Batman and Clark can't, but that's not the same person. Batman and Bruce Wayne, right? Unless they're Batman and Bruce Wayne, you probably only have one identity, right? So once you register, you want to go and log in then, all right? Now, it could automatically log in, all right? And we'll actually explore both of those options, all right? Now, oh, I was reviewing comments on my YouTube videos this weekend, just for the heck of it. And someone put, select count star where word equals all right equals three billion or something like that. So apparently I say all right a lot um, in my lectures. At any 
any rate, let's go and let's put it in to redirect it to the login page after we're done. And if there's an error, we'll display a user-friendly error. So let me go close out of this. Go here to my register page. I'm going to go and put an error message text box. So there's my text box for my air. Oh, I don't want a text box, right? I want labels. Label air. All right. So I'll go in my source. And does anyone remember how to add this event? Well, this is an event on the details view. Right. We go in here and start typing in the event that we want. So we want on item inserted. All right, because we want to do it after um, after the insert occurs equals, and then we have create new event. All right. It's important to follow through this because you want to be sure that you connect the event on the control with your code. All right. So I could have gone into the code behind and start coding this event, and that would be fine, except for the fact that it wouldn't be connected to my control. And after an item was inserted, that code wouldn't fire. So I'll go and say create new event. And now I have it in the control. And the control knows that this is the event that you're going to do after the item is inserted. And I can put code in here. And I can say if e dot exception. Okay, that is not correct. If it's not equal to null, I have an exception. Otherwise, I'm okay. So if there's a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Oh, come on. You guys had to have known vanilla ice. telling the client to do. So we're invoking a method on the response object because the response object sends stuff to the client. The request object gets stuff from the client. So 
response redirect. Default.aspx. All right, so drum roll, please. Let's first get the air. So that should give us a duplicate error. And there we get our error message. And I could put, in this case, I know the most probable error is that there's a duplicate user ID. All right? So I would phrase my error message something along those lines. So now let's go in and let's... Enter it in. Here we go. I'm trying to think of famous Douglases. Douglas Adams. So now I go and try to insert this, and I'm taken to the login page, and I can log in here. And there we go. All right. Now, I know they have the reasoning for doing it, uh, probably because a lot of time logins require like verification, like they'll send you an email and then you have to go in and, and, and validate that. Um, that would actually be a good thing if we had time next week, we could go through that functionality to, uh, to do that. Um, really, what would we do to make it automatically log on? Well, what does automatically log on mean? It means that the session variable is set. All right. So what we would have to do is we would have to. Now here's here's where auto number keys are a little bit of a pain. All right, because we don't know what number Douglas Adams just got. Right. So we would have to take his user ID, do a query in the database to get their user ID number, stuff that in the session variable, and then send them to the um, player information page. All right, and. So we'd have to do that. So um, wouldn't be that big a deal, but it would be a little bit of, of extra code that we would be, need to do. And it would be code very similar to what we would have on the, on the login page. All right. That's it for today. The one thing I did not cover, again, but is assume that you can take what you've seen in other instances and apply it, is what if I want to be able to change this to a password uh, control instead of a plain text box. Change this to a drop down. Validate to make sure that that's a date. Validate that that's required and so on. And that would all be exactly what we described before of creating a template column and going in and doing that. So if you run into any difficulty doing that, let me know. All right. Okay. We'll see you over in lab. No class this Thursday due to Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll see you next week.